I welcome you to the 2021 Franciscan Lecture Series, hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Tonight's lecture is by Dr. Garrett Galvin, OFM. The title of his lecture is Renewal in a Franciscan Key. His latest publication is a chapter on 2 Kings in the Jerome Biblical Commentary for the 21st century and will be available January 27th, 2022. Without further ado, I present to you the president of the Franciscan School of Theology, Dr. Garrett Galvin. Thanks so much, Michelle. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. And um, as I'm sure many of you can guess, there'll definitely be some biblical themes in this. And I'm really excited about this new, new Jerome biblical commentary. It's been about 30 years since the publication of the last one. And I think it'll be one of the best single volume Catholic biblical commentaries, along with the Paulist biblical commentary that came out a few years ago. So if you're willing to invest about 80 or $90, I think that's um, the best you can get for 80 or $90 with all the Bible being commented upon by different scholars. Now let's think about our lecture this evening, Renewal in a Franciscan Key. What we'll really want to focus on is kind of thinking about the importance first of renewal within the Franciscan movement and in the life of St. Francis and his followers. And then we'll try to think about how we are in need of renewal today, how this is a constant and maybe even dominant theme in the Psalms, and then something that we need to think about, especially in the light of COVID you know, with the lockdowns and the shutdowns and all the difficulties that people experienced and now trying to manage COVID and think more about community. So as we think about renewal, I think it's important to focus once again on the importance of the Franciscan vision. Um, we see within the Franciscan vision that renewal comes up again and again. It's an important piece of it. When we think of the early experiences of St. Francis, he said and was told, you know, go rebuild my church. As Francis tried to interpret that, we'll see that in the life of St. Francis by Thomas of Chilano, that's explained to us a little bit more. We hear the first work that Blessed Francis undertook after he had gained his freedom from the hands of his carnally minded father was to build a house of God. He did not try to build a new one, but he repaired an old one, restored an ancient one. So I think this is one of the really important facets of renewal this idea of repairing and restoring, that there is already something very good in our presence, but at times we're not able to see that because of difficulties in society or because of deterioration of an actual building, but that we can kind of focus on that and restore and repair that. And that's, I think, the heart of renewal. And so as we see this call to St. Francis and how he responded to it, we also then need to think about the biblical foundation for this call. And so I really like to focus on the Psalms of renewal. And we'll kind of find this word in some Psalms but one of the great difficulties that we have is that different versions of the Bible will translate it in different ways. So I will focus on some translations that are capturing the Hebrew term that I'm really focused on and translating it as renewal. Others translate it in different ways, but it's, it's really the same idea. So you can look at different versions of the Bible, and I think you get the idea of renewal, even though the language of renewal might not always be used. And then as we think about a larger set of Psalms, we have to 
see that we go beyond a form. And by a form, we can think of a form as a lament. We know many Psalms are making a complaint or a protest before they put their trust in God. And we call these a lament. But then there's also Psalms of praise. And we see that both within laments and praise, that there is this overarching theme of renewal. So renewal is something that can be found in many different ways. And so kind of the dominant two Psalms that capture this both in the lament tradition and in the praise tradition are Psalm 51 and Psalm 104. We'll return to these quite a bit because I think they both illustrate something that's, that's very important for us, the sense of renewal, but also the sense of the Holy Spirit as part of renewal. So in Psalm 51, we hear, a clean heart create for me, God, renew in me a steadfast spirit. Do not drive me from your presence, nor take me, nor take from me your Holy Spirit. Restore my spirit in your salvation. Sustain in me a willing spirit. So we get, we hear the word spirit three times just in these three verses. And we also have that great sense of renewal. This is a lament where someone recognizes sin in their lives, but then places their trust in God to help them overcome it. We'll also look at Psalm 104, which is a praise psalm. And we hear, when you give to them, they gather. When you open your hand, they are well filled. When you hide your face, they are lost. When you take away their breath, they perish and return to the dust from which they came. When you send forth your breath, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord be glad in these works. So here again, we see two, the two dominant themes, the, the theme of renewal, but also the theme of the Holy Spirit. It's not as explicit here, but it's the same word in Hebrew, breath. The word in Hebrew is ruah, and that can be translated as Holy Spirit. It can be translated also as breath or wind. And so in English, we might struggle a little bit, but if you're reading it in the Hebrew, you see the same theme of spirit and renewal and the how those two are linked together. So let's think a little bit about renewal. So in the Psalms, the verb renewal comes from the root to make new. So that's hadesh in Hebrew. And as we think about that, we see that um, there's a great emphasis on nature within this. And this kind of comes from the sense of a new moon, which we have, you know, every month. And this is just kind of a little connection, but there's this wonderful artist whose art I'm using here, Andrea McLean, a British woman, and she focuses on St. Francis quite a bit. And so the title of the artwork to the left of this is Brother, Son, Sister, Moon. So even within that moon, you get that sense of renewal and you can, this is a little bit um, not as precise, but you can get the sun on the right-hand side. And then if you look at the top left-hand side, you see the moon. So we have that sense of newness in nature, that sense of renewal in nature that we're invited to find in our own lives, to find in our church. So this is both a personal sense, especially as you saw in Psalm 51, and a communal sense or societal sense, as you see in Psalm 104. So very important for us to kind of have a sense of that. And as I've mentioned before, we will really kind of try to make some connections and think about the importance of this in the light of COVID, that we need renewal after and all the difficulties of the last 18 months and probably some more difficulties to come. So 
as we continue thinking about renewal, we have a sense of them in lament, but also in thanksgiving. And so we can kind of draw this kind of personal sense that we have in Psalm 51. So let's just think about this again, but think about it in a more personal sense, what needs to be renewed in our lives. You know, a clean heart create for me, God. Renew in me a steadfast spirit. Do not drive me from your presence or take me from your Holy Spirit. Restore my joy and your salvation. Sustain in me a willing spirit. So some key words there is heart. We know that within the Bible, the word lev is heart, and that that has a much greater importance than it even has in our, our modern understanding of anatomy. In the modern world, we have a sense of brain and heart, whereas really the heart contained both the brain as they understood it and you know, this pumping mechanism for blood. Um, so we have you know, trying to restore that, trying to renew that. And um, we also have this sense of the presence of God in our lives, trying to restore that, trying to renew that. And that's very important for all of us to kind of have that sense. And finally, we can get that kind of sense of will or that willing spirit and renewing the strength of our will. So, so heart, presence of God and our own will, we want renewed. And then as we think about it in a little bit more of a communal sense, we think about, you know, really the grandeur of creation in space, the importance of creation in our world. So here we get this much greater focus on creations, much greater focus on society, community, on earth. When you give to them, they gather. When you open your hand, they are well filled. When you hide your face, they are lost. When you take away their breath, they perish and return to the dust from which they came. When you send forth your breath, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord be glad in these works. So here we see this much greater, um, almost universal sense of the whole face of the earth being renewed by God. So as I try to think about renewal, I would like to focus on you know, an experience that I had. So as we look at this picture, um, we're looking kind of at the same thing, but from two perspectives. This is a, kind of a new park, relatively new park. I visited it maybe 10 years ago for the first time in New York City. And so if you look at the inlaid picture kind of to the right of your screen, you see why the park is called the High Line. And below it, you see kind of the, the streets of New York. And there was this line, a train line that used to come into New York, you know, maybe about a hundred years ago to stay above the streets and to deliver goods. After a while, as trucks became more efficient and a little bit able to manage turns and things like that, they just did away with this line. There was no need to bring in trains on this. And it ultimately became an eyesore. And you can kind of get a sense of that eyesore from the pedestrian level underneath. You know, you've got this kind of ugly grating. But then, you know, about 20 years ago, someone kind of got the idea, well, how can we kind of change this? How can we renew this? And so they created, you know, this walkway. And I think you can walk for a couple of miles now on this. You see all the bushes and greenery. And, you know, if you look it up on the internet, you'll see lots of other views. But, you know, when you're up there, it's really a life-giving experience, a renewing experience. You get to see views of the city that you don't get, but you get all this greenery that you don't get normally unless you're in a park in the city. Um, so, so this is, I think, giving us a sense of just how important renewal is. The, the sense of, you know, just about anything can be transformed if we're creative, if we bring, you know, God's goodness into the equation, if we let ourselves think about, you know, how do we restore something? 
how do we repair something so that this thing that, you know, 100 years ago was of great service to New York, getting goods all over the city, now is in service to New York in a much different way as people who, you know, got nutrition from this at one stage now are getting, I would say, kind of mental nutrition, being able to clear their heads, being able to just experience the goodness of creation in the midst of the city. So I think this is one kind of concrete example of many that we have to be focused on as we see places that collect us where we can see each other and see nature in a very positive sense. Now, another piece of renewal is the importance of the Holy Spirit in this process. Now, I think we're accustomed to talking about the Holy Spirit, you know, usually in more New Testament senses. We see the role of the Spirit in Jesus's ministry. This is particularly the case in Luke's gospel. Um, but also we hear about the paraclete in John's gospel. But we, and we know, of course, in the ministry after Jesus's life, just how important the Holy Spirit is in the Acts of the Apostles or in the writings of St. Paul. But we've been called, you know, by a number of scholars, and I would say the most important scholar here is, is Jack Levison, um, to think about the role of the Spirit in the Old Testament. And I think this is what's so important in terms of the Psalms, in terms of, you know, our opportunities to see that the Spirit is present in so many different ways, that the Spirit is not simply just present after Jesus's life. So as we look at the Old Testament, we'll want to think more about the role of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and certainly in the Psalms. And you know, as I've kind of suggested, this has been neglected at times. And I think we know that within the Catholic Church, um, we're not a Pentecostal church by name. You know, by Pentecostal, we're focusing on Pentecost or the Holy Spirit, but we're really called to be much more mindful of the Spirit. And we're and the Franciscan tradition is one of those traditions that is very mindful of the Spirit. So as we kind of go back to kind of look at this picture again, um, we have a sense, and this is the same artist that did the Brother Sun Sister Moon, you know, of this kind of famous depiction of St. Francis and the Wolf of Gubbio. But who is at the center of it? The Holy Spirit. We see that dove coming down um, and enlivening St. Francis's work and ministry. So, so this presence of the spirit is something that I think is very important for us as we try to um, think about renewal, think about what needs to be repaired, think about what needs to be restored and how the Holy Spirit really wants us to be part of that. And so thinking then about Psalm 104, you know, we said that this was a little more subtle in terms of how it's translated, that we have the word breath in English, but that word breath is translating the very same Hebrew term that translated Holy Spirit in Psalm 51. And Jack Levinson, the author of the book that I just showed, is you know, really pushing us to not bifurcate or trifurcate these things. Um, that we can easily kind of dismiss breath as just some type of human action, you know, that we do. Um, but he'll say, whenever we hear breath, the spirit is part of it. And the spirit is never mere spirit. The spirit in immortal is no less than the breath of the almighty. So wind, breath, and spirit are all ways to translate the Hebrew term ruah, but whenever we hear those words, we're called to think a little bit about the Holy Spirit. Another thing that Levinson really accentuates for us is just how important it is to kind of have a sense of God's spirit and that this spirit 
is a spirit that, as he tells us here, rehabilitates. And as we think about that word, rehabilitate, I think we're also called to think about repair and restore. This is the work of the spirit, you know, to make things new. We hear in, in the book of Revelation, God makes all things new. So that sense of renewal is there. And so as we kind of continue then moving on, I'd like to think a little bit about some images of renewal that are throughout the Psalms. And so what I'm really trying to suggest here is that when we think about the Psalms, oftentimes we're, we're told to think about, okay, what's the premier theme or the most important theme within the book of the Psalms? And that's 150 Psalms. And so sometimes people will say refuge is the great theme of the Psalms. Um, but I would argue that it's very important for us to read the book of the Psalms through the prism or the lens of renewal. And we'll find that coming up repeatedly in the Psalms in ways that maybe we haven't always considered. So one area that we see is the idea of a new song. Um, we find this in verse 33, but this is also present in five other Psalms and a number of other areas. We'll hear oftentimes as we hear in Psalm 40, and put a new song in my mouth, a hymn to our God. So whenever we have that theme of a new song, and it's certainly something I think if we pay attention in the responsorial psalm at Mass, we'll hear this repeatedly, this idea of a new song. What we're really asking for is renewal, you know, that we want to be able to speak of God, to sing of God and with a renewed energy rather than um, a tired energy or something like that. And then we'll see in Psalm 81, four, blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our solemn feast. And so we know within the Jewish calendar and somewhat within our Christian calendar, we can think about Easter, that it's tied to you know, the full moon, that it's tied to kind of this new moon. And so there's a sense of renewal that comes with that cycle. And that in the cycles of our lives, in the cycles of our liturgy, in the cycles of the year, that there's always a chance for renewal. We get to begin something new. So that's going to be important for us. So we think of a new moon, a new opportunity, a new feast. So this then is in a very important tie to creation. And if we think about Psalm 104 in particular, you know, we see there the opportunity um, to see God's goodness in creation. So here in California, you know, if we're not experiencing a drought every spring, we have got these green hills um, where we have that sense of renewal. I think everyone in the different parts of the country finds those senses of renewal at different times. But creation or nature is helping us with that. So sometimes we have a need or we're aided from that by our own kind of spiritual lives, by a sense of where we can improve. And then in other times, we're aided by it, by what's going on, that we see new life at certain times of years. We see, you know, young little birds, or we see the new green shoots, and God's creation is, is helping us and inspiring us. So ultimately, then, the book of Psalms, or the Psalter, understands creation as a manifestation of God's faithfulness. And so, so this is very important for us. Another way to translate faithfulness is trust that God is trustworthy, that there is going to be a new moon, that there is going to be a spring, that there is going to be new life. God does not fail to deliver on those promises and is trustworthy and creation shows us that. 
as we think about these creation psalms, once again, they have this same attribute that we saw in Psalm 51 and Psalm 104. They cover a lot of different forms or a lot of different types of psalms. And so I just kind of show here that we have praise psalms, like Psalm 8 and 19 and 29 and 33, more kind of liturgical praise in Psalm 68, but we also have lament in 89 and 139 and 102, and we have thanksgiving in 92. So we find this theme running across the Psalms, the importance of creation and renewal. You know, I'd like to, us to just think about the Psalms. I think when we hear a Psalm, it's important for us to think, okay, what's going on here? If you kind of study the academic literature, you can break them up into many different types, perhaps 15 different types. But I think it's better and easier for us in our spiritual journey to think about them either as a lament or a praise so that we have kind of a sense of what's going on. Those are the two most basic categories. And we see that you know, creation is involved in both of those, that renewal is involved in both of those. As we then try to think a little bit about renewal in the light of COVID, we have all heard, I think, on the news about you know, many people that are suffering during this time period or have suffered and previous, we can think about you know, places that had really severe lockdowns. I think about Spain, where I think you know, a lot of children were never able to leave their apartments for six weeks. And this just does not lead to good mental health, being kind of in front of a screen. That's just not helpful. And so as we think about our mental health, we're pushed in the direction of creation. As we think about some of the challenges that we all have in our contemporary world, one of those challenges is that most of us are spending about 10 hours a day kind of looking at a screen. I'm looking at a screen right now. You're probably looking at screens right now. And so there's something good that can be gained from that without a doubt. I mean, this is how we're making our livelihoods and working and at times enjoying recreation. But at the same time, we can't allow that to completely dominate our lives. And so the Psalms are going to push us into nature, to push us to enjoy a walk in the park, you know, to enjoy um, some time hiking, to enjoy a little bit of time at the beach. Any type of time outdoors has been proven to improve our attention, to lower our stress, to better our mood, to reduce depression and other risks of disorder, and ultimately to help us to have more empathy and cooperation in our lives. The Psalms pointing us in the direction of creation for a reason. This just makes us better people. It makes us healthier people. It makes us people with more joy and peace in our lives. And so therefore, let's take a look at some of those Psalms that are really emphasizing that we can think of perhaps the most famous Psalm, Psalm, 120, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, there's nothing I lack. In green pastures, you let me graze to safe waters, you lead me, you restore my strength. You guide me along the right path for the sake of your name. So we see the power of nature, green pastures, waters, and then this idea of restoration that was so important to Francis. We can look at Psalm 1. Happy those who do not follow the counsel of the wicked, nor go the way of sinners, nor sit in the company of scoffers. Rather, the law of the Lord is their joy. God's law they study day and night. They are like a tree planted near streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaves never wither. Whatever they do prospers, but not the wicked. They are like traff, chaff driven by the wind. So once again, we have this image of nature of an evergreen tree, you know, by a little brook or wadi or stream that's always able to stay healthy because it has a good source of nourishment and water. But then we can think of the chaff as kind of dead leftover leaves you know, from a grain of wheat or something like that. So here again, 
we see the importance of nature kind of showing us the evergreen thing is something that we need to kind of model a little bit in our own lives. Here's another image. But I, like an olive tree in the house of God, trust in God's faithful love forever. So again, a tree, something that's producing nourishment in terms of olives. And finally, in Psalm 92, the just shall flourish like the palm tree, shall grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bear fruit, even in old age, always vigorous and sturdy. So once again, we have these beautiful images from nature of a cedar, of a palm tree, you know, things that bearing fruit, things giving shade, things that speak to us of life. So as we tie concepts to renewal, the Psalms give us kind of four directions to go in that I think are very helpful for renewal. Having a sense of God's blessings in our lives, God's goodness, where we experience that. The Psalms are always asking us to think about that. Having a sense of God's goodness, that's another very important theme within the Psalms. Where do we find goodness in our lives, in our world, in creation? The third theme is this theme of the Hebrew word is chesed. This is a word that gets translated many different ways. One way that we can translate it, and often we see in our Bibles, is loving kindness. Another way that I think is just as important is solidarity, you know, simply love. All those are used frequently in the Bible to translate this idea of chesed. And this concept of love or solidarity or kindness is a place where we get renewal, when we have that sense in our lives and know how important this is for God. You know, the great Psalm that focuses on this is right there at the end, 136. The word comes up 26 times in this Psalm. And finally, the idea of glory is very important. Glory gives us a sense of the depth and the weight of God's goodness or God's love and how that's manifested in our world. We should be looking for all these things as sources of renewal in the Psalms in our lives, thinking about our blessings, thinking about goodness, thinking about love, thinking about God's glory in our world. Now, an important piece of renewal is you know, wisdom, because not all of this comes naturally. You know, a lot of times we have to learn you know, how to have better mental health. We have to learn how to see God in the world. You know, there's some people that it's fortunate that have great fortune in their lives, and this comes naturally too. But if you're anything like me, um, you have to kind of learn some of this. You have to make an effort. We have to kind of put on our Franciscan lens to get that Franciscan vision. It's something that you know, I've been trying to do for the last 30 years, and I think I've learned a few tricks, but then there's always that need for renewal. I'm going to go get my eyes tested in a month. These aren't working as well now, and we all need that kind of checkup for renewal in our lives. And so the Psalms are focused on wisdom, and this wisdom is very actual in our lives. You know, wisdom is you know, how we can live better, how we can do things better, how we can apply it in our lives. So as we try to do that, there's this sense that you know, Torah that we hear about in the Old Testament, which can mean law, but can also mean instruction, put those Psalms into practice when we have that sense of, of wisdom. That wisdom as an abstract isn't that important. It's wisdom that's practiced that can be important. The Psalms are trying to show us how to practice wisdom by focusing on blessing, goodness, love, and glory. And ultimately, we see in Psalm 112, you know, it is well, or better translated good, with the man who deals generously in lands, who conducts his affairs with justice. This will lead to wisdom. So I'd like to focus a little bit more on Psalm 1. We heard it um, just a few minutes ago as we thought about that tree, you know, and how 
being by the waters allowed that tree to flourish. But Psalm 1 is also one of the last Psalms to be written. It serves as an introduction to the other 149 and therefore is you know, an interpretive key to it, just like Genesis 1 does this for the rest of Genesis, and I would say for the rest of the Bible, by focusing on goodness. As we think about this, in Psalm 1, we have these kind of very important Hebrew words, ashrei ha'ish, which we can think of, happy is the one, or blessed is the one. We all are familiar with the Beatitudes, the, the Greek word for that is makarios, but the Hebrew word for by, beatitude is ashrei. So we can think of blessed is the one. That's what someone is focusing on. So the fortunate person or the blessed person engages in activities that renew them and avoids activities that will harm them. So that's what we pray for in Psalm 51. You know, a new heart, take away that heart that is harmed, that is attracted to activities that harm them. And then as we thought about before, that blessed person is like a tree planted by flowing waters. And this is a wonderful evocative image for us here in California, where we can look at, especially this time of year, you know, just kind of very brown landscapes, but we see that one oak tree, that green tree, that's found a way to have life in the midst of death at this time of year. And that's the promise of renewal for us, that at times we have to have life in the midst of death. So as we think a little bit more about ashray, happy or blessed, we can see this you know, in many of these wisdom psalms, you know, 132, 41, 120, 119, 128. Also, we find it in some laments in 32 and 41. So what are the attributes we are talking about? Happy are all who take refuge in God. Happy those concerned for the lowly and the poor. Happy are they those who dwell in your house. They never cease to praise you. And so for us, you know, what does this mean? You know, in, in a context where there is no temple, you know, now um, for Jews, we can think about that. When these were written, you know, there was no temple. And for us, we have a different sense of temple. But I think what it's really trying to get at is trusting God, that we may not have some of the things that we're accustomed to have when we trust God. So for the Jews, they were lacking the temple, but they still place their trust in God. For us, you know, especially coming out of COVID, maybe we're lacking some of the social connection that we're accustomed to. We're lacking trust. You know, we know, we just hear in the news about people kind of faking that they've been vaccinated and things like that. And, and they're in our midst and they're not being honest with us sometimes. And so, so trust can break down. And yet, you know, we're called to trust in God and to detect the ways to go forward, you know, in difficult times. And finally, we are happy the people who know you, Lord, who walk in the radiance of your face. Another key concept is promise. We receive certain promises in the Psalms that will lead to renewal. The promise, the Lord is faithful, the Lord is trustworthy. That's a great promise. We have a promise of God's love for us. Chesed in 25.10, we hear all the paths of the Lord are faithful love toward those who honor the covenant demands. And finally, we have a promise that the Lord is accessible. As we think about renewal, we hear we can see the experience of goodness when we consider the role of mercy within the Psalms. So a number of years ago now, we had that year of mercy. And that was a year really focused on chesed, on solidarity with others, on God's solidarity with us, on God's love for us that removes all obstacles to him. So. The Psalms, especially when we think about Hesed, are, are focusing us on God's relationship with us, God's passionate love for us. And, um, and one thing we can forget is that the Psalms are always poetry. And so we know prose is the language of legal codes, but poetry is the language of love. 
And so God has this deep love for us. And so God is felt ultimately as everlasting, unending chesed or love or solidarity or mercy. So, and we hear this in Psalm 86 and repeatedly in Psalm 136. We can think of God as tender compassion or mercy, another Hebrew word, rehem. And then we can think of God as hanu, gracious, graciousness and mercy. And so finally, as we kind of try to pull all of this together um, for us to have that kind of sense of renewal, for, uh, for us to be able to see something that was dead come to life again, to see something that can be restored or repaired, we need to be able to focus on blessing. We need to be able to try to see the world with the opportunities that God sees the world. And so while we find renewal in many Psalms of lamentation. Inevitably and invariably, they end with a focus on trust in God. And part of renewal is restoring that trust or expanding that trust or living more and more in trust. We find this blessing perspective, you know, starting immediately in the book of Psalms. You know, we said, Ashrei Ha'ish. Happy is the one, or maybe even better, blessed is the one. It's a true beatitude. We find ultimately in Psalm 8, another creation psalm. You know, this is to me the pinnacle of the Psalms. Yet you have made us, or them, little less than a God, crown them with glory and honor. This is our anthropology, a fancy theological word for what does it mean to be human? According to the Bible, it means that we're little less than a God. I think we're all aware and very mindful of the times we fail and that we're a lot less, but we're called to be a little less and reminded that we're a little less, that the divine spark is within us, that we are made in the image and likeness of God. So we see that great connection between Psalm 8 and Genesis 1, 26. And finally, we connect this to our new Testament experience. We connect this to the explicit mention of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, you know, that this is what ties it all together. And so I'd like to just end with John's gospel and what John promises us through the words of Jesus. I pray not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me through their word so that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they all may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So thank you for spending this time with me this evening or this morning or wherever you are on the internet, whatever time it is. It's been wonderful being with you. Thank you. This opportunity is brought to you by the Franciscan School of Theology Development Department. Let's give Father Garrett a round of applause. Thank <laughs> you.